been so kind to host us this year and past years, and they're a great partner. And you notice we're here in downtown Boston, another beautiful place to be. So today we're going to be talking about effective scaling with pivoting tactics, and this is really an all-star cast. And so I'm very excited to bring up Rabi to Pressure. take the rest of this over. Thanks, Rabi. <laughs> Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to this exciting sessions of Startup Boston Week, the eighth Startup Boston Week conference. And my name is Rabe Majidi. I'm myself a co-founder at a medical device company in Massachusetts, early stage AI-based um, wearable device company that we're trying to help rehabilitation of people with shoulder injuries. And it's been my second year supporting the Startup Boston, designing tracks for the founder track. So welcome to this session. And first of all, make sure you're in the right session, please. So um, today we are focusing on AI-based startups in this session and the crucial moments in their journey that whether it's scaling or pivoting, and we wanna get um, insights from our experienced panelists that um, what are the to do and not to do's for scaling and pivoting when the timing comes. So I'll start with um, asking the panel to introduce themselves, please. Sasha, please. Hi, I'm Sasha. I'm a partner with Remus Capital. We're an early stage venture fund um, between Boston, San Francisco, and the UK. And we primarily do vertical based AI uh, across con construction, industrials, fintech, a few other generalist sectors. And we also do a bit in healthcare. So Shahid Azim, I uh, founder CEO of C10 Labs. We're an AI venture studio and a venture fund based in Kendall Square. Uh, in terms of background, I've done a number of early stage venture backed companies, uh, primarily in consumer and health uh, licensed technologies from MIT, um, and uh, great to be here. Hey everybody, my name is Ali Mahmood. I'm a principal at Glasswing Ventures. And for those of you who don't know, Glasswing's a Boston based firm. Uh, started back in 2016 with the express focus on how AI and other frontier software are going to reshape B2B workflows in the economy. So. Um, obviously very excited by all things AI these days and uh, have a lot of expertise to go with it. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. So before uh, we hear from the panel, let's get a feedback, I mean, from the uh, audiences to basically um, make sure that we are covering the material based on the um, experience and um, passion of the audiences. Mm -hmm. So let's see how many founders and co-founders we have in this room. We have quite a few. And how many investors we have in the room? How many okay. students? Is that the rest? Okay. How many engineers? Awesome. Um, so how many seed pre seed stages? How many gross stage and scaling stages? We have one. Awesome. So um, we have pretty much diverse group. So uh, let's just start with the questions. Sorry, can I just ask one more question? How many people are either fundraising or planning to be fundraising soon? Okay. And how many people think you have product market fit? Okay. More than fundraising. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen that in a expecting. room in my life. <laughs> okay. Oh, I should raise my hand too. Can we yeah. ask you guys for feedback actually? <laughs> no. Okay. Awesome. So um, let's just start with the first question. And then we try to make this session very interactive. So in meanwhile, if you have any question and you want to um, pause us and, and add more to this, feel free. Uh, we're here all to learn from each other. So um, let's just start with the first question. Maybe I start with Ellie. So um, for general type of startups, not necessarily uh, AI-based startups, the scaling happens when you have, like the folks in the room, you have a product market feed and sustainable growth metrics and you pivot when you see that obviously that the market doesn't respond and then you you look for a different market but for ai startups um it might be slightly different so 
Um, what's your uh, perspective on that? What are the key indicators that an AI startup is ready to scale or pivot? Um, obviously, uh, very dependent on you know who you're building for, what industry you're in, what your product does. Um, I think the key things to remember, and if you haven't been exposed to this already, you definitely will be, is that AI is very dependent on the data you're working with and how that applies to the use case you're building for. So think, right, pre-AI, you have folks who are building a product, and for you users, it's pretty binary. I mean, maybe you have some buggy code or whatever, but like it either works or it doesn't. And then AI introduces this whole probabilistic scale of uh, kind of works or oh, did that just hallucinate or, you know, it's not a binary outcome. So understanding, again, based on what your product is, what data you're working with, what are some more intermediate steps that you can set for yourself and that you can communicate to your design partners, your customers, or whoever you're building with to say, hey, he, let's all get this out of the way. This is not going to be perfect from day zero, but uh, based on the data set that you can give me or based on what we do have right now, here's a milestone that we can work for and prove that we are building something of value for them to invest in you, for them to buy you know, your, give you money um, and then eventually get from maybe a proof of concept to, uh, to another product. And I'd love for, I mean, Shahid, you guys have yeah. Venture Studio, so. Yeah, so, um, you know, so from our point of view, we have a, uh, we're sector agnostic, so that's one thing. We're also pre-seed and seed state. So we see teams that are typically often with a really interesting idea, really strong team, and coming in and sort of want to work on, the, on that idea with us to teams that have raised a few million dollars, have the product market fit, and are looking to accelerate, but still have certain gaps that they need our, um, our, our help in, so outside of just pure capital. So our, our field of view on answering a question like this, which is, you know, um, you know, what is sort of unique about scaling in the AI sort of uh, landscape, or if you're working broadly across applied AI, what are the signals? And um, one of the things that we've seen is that um, often if you're really truly leveraging AI in some unique way, you're gonna create significant amount of value. And if you have thought about it strategically, you should be able to capture significant amount of value uh, as well, not just uh, create the value. And so the, from, a, from a product market fit sort of a signal, one of the things that we've seen is that when teams get it right, the signal is a pretty clear signal. Uh, which is, you know, customers, uh, you can't sort of deliver fast enough or uh, there's a very clear signal that, you know, uh, customers cannot get enough for this uh, product or service. So if you look at sort of the portfolio of companies, the one or two companies that tend to be outliers are that, that have really sort of tweaked fast enough, iterated fast enough to really zero in on that signal of the product market fit. And, um, uh, you know, in our case, it's, uh, when we look at the sort of the spectrum of companies, um, it's a pretty clear signal that you know there's there's something special in terms of the value prop uh, that's that's going on there. So, so, okay, thank you. So, um, also when we talk about the product market fit and. Um, Maybe um, for AI startups, it, it might be slightly different that how founder, founders can identify and understand their market needs effectively. Can you comment on that? I can jump in to start. Yeah, um, I think, again, understanding what it's going to take to build an AI product is critical, right? And data, I'll keep coming back to that, but also understanding the nuances that go with that. So. Uh, whereas you might have been able to build, again, I'm using a simple SaaS product as a baseline, but something very quick that someone could, you know, some engineer could swipe his credit card and had that discretionary spending and like try it right away. Uh, you can get to kind of like a proof of value pretty quickly. Here, in a case, maybe you're working with enterprises, a lot of what we invest in is enterprise facing. You're going to need to get access to different systems of data and then there's all kinds of you know challenges that go with that concerns around privacy right um of course with the data itself but also how you use that data explainability and other things that you need to be ready to communicate and have a conversation with people who don't work with ai every day right you know an it department is getting flooded all the time with everything under the sun um so 
it can be tricky to kind of navigate some of those uh, dynamics that frankly have little to do with like how you're building your product and more to do with do you understand the enterprise? How much is your champion pounding the table for what you're building? Because there's a lot of human uh, human elements to this as well. I think the other thing I was going to add, so I was talking to the CEO of a hospital recently um, about how as early stage startups, especially the area of healthcare, where truthfully I think it'll take about 10 years for us to see the real use applications of AI in healthcare, especially in a hospital setting, um, to build together with them. So one of the comments that the CEO was making was that they keep getting pitched by various startups, but those startups don't even have access to a lot of the proprietary data that the hospital has. So a lot of the recommendations being made are often wrong. And they were like, hey, I really wish people would actually come to us and try to build with us, whether we have a stake in the business, a strategic influence of some sort, but then we could find a way that is HIPAA compliant to work together to build something that makes more sense for these environments. Because without a ton of exposure, it's actually very hard to understand some of these extraordinarily complex problems. And so if you're an early stage startup, also thinking about as you're building your product, if you're doing it in an area that's super complex, highly regulated, building with someone or having a strategic investor where you can get access access to that first party data, which I'm sure we're going to spend plenty of time talking about data, um, makes a big difference. And so I would also just think about that from the concept of, of building your product uh, from the ground up. That's very um, interesting that you brought this up. So we also have actually recently like a small pivot for our own company. So we were trying, like a lot of folks in the room, we were thinking that we had our product market fit. We talked to 15, 50 surgeons across the states and um, also like um, different conferences, everything. And then recently we started doing study with New England Baptist and Boston Sports Shoulder Center. Mm -hmm. And then when we, the data came out and we look into the data, we were like, we were wrong. So the market is something else. And then it was like truly accessing to the real data um, is very important, I guess, for AI based startups and I, I really experienced this. Thank you for bringing this up. So um, one additional comment there would be, um, especially in a fast moving market where the landscape is shifting um, and can shift overnight, right? So a new feature released by OpenAI kills, can potentially kill out a lot of businesses overnight, right? We're, we're in this sort of interesting moment, right? In a fast moving market, it's more important to focus on speed of iteration rather than sort of just optimizing and, and getting it perfect. So I think specifically, and, and also specifically when you're thinking about architectures and, and thinking about building your product, uh, not everything day one needs to be enterprise grade, right? Like you need to build something fast enough to get it in the hands of users, to get the feedback loops as short as possible, right? They don't need to be weeks, they don't need to be months, they should be hours and days, right? And um, and so if you focus on that, I think that's it's a much smarter strategy given just where we are in the life cycle of uh, applied AI across industries and sectors. Awesome. So um, maybe a question for Sasha. So what are the essential components of a scalable AI product? Um, so we look for, and I think we've talked about this a little already, but the first really thing is the data moat. Uh, I, we can't say this enough, but it's just so important to have access to first party prior, um, proprietary data. Um, so I think that's the first thing. That's also your mechanism of defensibility. I think in the long run, if you don't have access to that, depending on what models you use, depending on where you're getting data from, you, you don't have a backbone at the end of all of that. Uh, I think the second thing is around stickiness and, and just being able to show product stickiness. And so, you know, we have a later question where we can dive more into this, but I think as a whole, being able to have customers that stay is extremely important, not just in AI, but in any business. I think particularly here, the switching cost is low. And so with the sheer volume of AI companies that are coming out as well, so if you have a product that people stay sticky to, that makes a very big difference for scalability. Does it also impact uh, the fundraising? It does. I mean, one of our first questions is always, it, it depends. Like, I think when you come in, you should be transparent about what your business does. But one of our first questions is always what the data source is. Um, and then unless if you're a wrapper and it's coming from somewhere else, but that's usually the first question is how are you getting it? Awesome. I think um, Sasha nailed it. So uh, I don't 
I think I have anything else you want to add? Anything? Yeah, I think um, I, I'll just bring in the human element again, right? How you get that data. Some One of you as a founder or early team needs to figure out how to go get that, right? So that's critical. Yes. Yeah. So um, lack of focus for AI startup, AI-based startups, it's um, our big risk. I guess for them. So, um, can you comment on common pitfalls that when startup AI-based startups are scaling um, and pivoting, what are those common pitfalls that can affect them, and how can they be avoided? Maybe I can just follow up because this is based on what I last just said on sticking it. So, a lot of people today are building APIs. They're relatively easy to access. They have very low friction. This is great in the sense that you can get a lot of customers. But where this falls short is that they then don't stay. The switching cost has become so low that one of the biggest pitfalls that we see is someone has these huge spikes in getting users when they release something or they release an uh, updated version. And then a lot of those customers leave because it's too easy. And so they're striking the balance at the beginning of creating just enough friction where someone is in the door or maybe you're slow rolling how quickly they could get access to various updates. You have to do something to keep them there. Otherwise, we see very high churn uh, with a lot of companies that I'm seeing with their metrics is just because people leave quickly because it's frankly too low in terms of friction um, and you want to avoid that switching cost as a business. You, you want to have people stick with you to the prior point. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I see. I would say, uh, just to add to that, I think, uh, and this is definitely not unique to AI businesses and AI ventures. I think premature scale is something that uh, you have to be super careful about. Um, you have to be super careful, especially when capital is, I think nowadays it's less of a chance because capital is a little harder to raise these days. But when capital is, um, let's say, free flowing, uh, it's very easy to go down the path of premature scale. And, um, and then you start getting false signals about sort of uh, what's, what's really sort of um, a, a scalable business or not. So I think as regardless of sort of the overall uh, financing sort of market and conditions, you need to be very cautious when to you want to put your, um, you want to accelerate the business. And, um, and I think a lot of this has to be truly, truly understanding your customers, right? It's not just about, you know, weekly surveys and, you know, not superficial stuff, but really understanding why they're using your product, why they would continue to use their product, and then very systematically building defensibility around your core mode, right? So whether it's additional data, whether it's a broad integration strategy, uh, whatever it may be, um, you know, so that's how I would probably uh, think about that. Um, just a couple quick things. I agree with everything that's been said and a couple quick things to add. I think it is important to have a big vision, no doubt about it. Uh, don't try to, you don't need to build a platform that's enterprise grade from, you know, the first day before anybody even sees it, right? And I think this is probably more just a simple product uh, best practice, but really focusing on the workflow and in an AI context, right? Generally, most applications are trying to automate or simplify or co-pilot or whatever a workflow. So you need to understand that work workflow upside down, inside out, backwards, who is impact, who is delighted by it, who gets fired if you do well, right? Who owns the budget? Really understand that um, and then nail that because that's where you'll get your stickiness from. That's where you'll be able to prove your value. And I think, again, in depending what type of application or platform you're building, to Sasha's point, you're going to, if you are successful, you will see five copycats within six months, yeah. right? Like the, the speed of actually building products is also accelerating. Um, so it's something to be super, super mindful of. Right. So um, the role of leadership is also very important for AI-based companies. So based on what we talked, so how do you make sure that you can keep the team aligned and on one core objective and avoid expanding too quickly without having like a infra infrastructure to support the growth? So um, when um, Usually when like a startup companies, they're fundraising, you see like the structure of the company, usually like a ML engineer, there's like a um, product development. So 
um, what are the key leadership roles that are important when you look into their um, profile and then you want to choose the company basically in your uh, venture to fund them? The co-founder fit question, I guess. Um, I mean, again, it, I think it's highly, de not to give the it depends answer, but um, other elements to think about is if you have an idea about what your AI strategy is going to be, what types of models you're going to work with, and through that, what kind of data you're going to work with, finding someone who has spent time with those, you know, different data sets, different types of data, different models. Um, as an investor, love to see someone who scaled that type of system before in a co-founder. Um, but yeah, it, it depends. Can you bring an example, real life example, um, like between the companies that you've chosen and the one that you say, no, nicely, no. I think we a lot love of, to hear about you, keep me posted, but. Yeah. I think but, it, um, there was a, a company I just talked to this week and I found out they found a technical co-founder and I was very excited for them. Um, I think to build a defensible AI company, you need someone who has built AI before. Um, I once had a founder tell me that he had a competitive advantage in building an AI product because they were not AI people. They did not study data science. They knew nothing about it. And I'm like, good luck with that. Um, I haven't heard from him. Uh, so that's, I mean, it's just low hanging fruit there that I gave you, but uh, it's so important. Um, so we definitely look for technical co-founders, but even just on the starting founding team, most of the initial hires are all engineers. Um, whether you've recently started getting into AI and machine learning or you came from it, um, machine learning's not really new, but um, we also still look for, I, we do look for founders who frankly are good at go-to-market, who are just gonna pound the payment and be great at sales because you could build an amazing product, but if it never gets out there and you can't figure out product market fit, you have a big problem. And many, many companies have died on the table with the team. And so I think we still, we have a lot of co-founder pairs where one is definitely the business person and the strategy and the other person is the engineer and it's, it's not new just for AI, but I think there's a reason why that has worked historically over time um, is that you sort of need that balance. And we, we do also tend to sort of interview the technical folks to understand and make sure that they are aligned around are you focused? Like you kind of mentioned a point about focus, which is a huge problem. You just try to do too many things. We see this all the time. And I think we tend to try and find the founders who are like, I'm going to focus here and we're going to try this. If it doesn't work, I'm going to pivot quickly. If that doesn't work, I'm going to pivot again. And just the people who are able to quickly articulate how they're thinking about that journey and quickly failing or quickly trying again tend to be people who usually get money faster. Um, so one of the things that um, we've we look out for is like complementary teams, right? So this idea, complementary teams and deep sectoral sort of expertise. So if you're building in uh, telecoms or mobility, having spent uh, time in the field, building, rolling out, shipping product is super important, understanding the customer. And so uh, the best teams often be, you know, certainly, you know, the typical makeup, you've got a technical co-founder, and perhaps a founder that is closer to the customer. Um, and uh, one of the things that we often um, look out for is we don't necessarily want teams to be technology first. They should always be oriented to solving a problem. Uh, because if you, you can go down this rat hole of being technology first and kind of losing the big picture often. So, uh, and you know, it's easy to say that because we're obviously in a, in, a, in a city where there's a lot of research and a lot of PIs and a lot of uh, research from the labs that are um, really breakthrough research in, in almost every field. Um, so it's, it's, the research is important, the technology is important, but it's super important to make sure that the, the founding teams also understand that it, at the end of the day, uh, the product has to be used by human beings and there's a user experience and all these things really, really matter. Uh, the best technology does not necessarily win, right? So we know all these things. AI is very similar in that way. It's the user experience. It's the value creation that happens when you uh, when you really create alignment, both from a technology uh, and a value capture and an experience point of view. So I think if you have the right dynamics at the founding level, it translates well into the products that we build, right? So uh, that's one of the things that we often try and 
look for. Anything you want to add? Okay, before we um, get to the fun part to um, hear about the role of incubators and zero to one challenges, um, so I want to hear from the audiences. Is there any specific question? Yeah. Oh, we have three. Sh sure, in the front. <laughs> we'll kind of go around. Good afternoon. My name is Shazab Lada. I'm the founder of Forte Investment Group. Um, question is around, you talked about product fit, right? And the importance of product market fit. Um, how forgiving, um, Shahid, is the market given the fact that, you know, the newness of it and also kind of the iterative nature of it. I love the fact that you hit on humanizing the experience on, um, you know, really the go-to-market pieces, elements as well, Sasha, that you hit on. So, so Shahid, specifically, how forgiving is the market given the newness? Yeah. Um, I can, I, maybe I'll comment on, on how we look at the world rather than the market, right? So I think um, when you have a team that has something, that has some unique point of views and perhaps some deep sector expertise, uh, you bet. You always bet on the team first, right? So that's the the fundamentals are still there, even in this fast moving market. Um, and you want to work with investors that are backing. No first version of the product really works, right? We know that, right? It's sort of the version seven or the eight. By the time you sort of get those cycles out and and the kinks out, so um, so so the one thing is you got to find investors that are really willing to take a little bit of that journey and uh, with you. And, um, and I think the realistic expectations are that, you know, it takes multiple shots at goal when you're trying to do something hard and complex. You're not going to get it just right. And, um, and so, yeah, a lot of it is, you know, founder investor alignment, but also I think the fundamentals when you're trying to build uh, large complex systems of really trying to solve hard complex problems. Um, uh, people understand that you know there's a process and a methodology to it, and and you break it down systematically. So uh, that's our view. I, I think. Uh, yeah. I think it's harder to raise money if you aren't showing the signals early, though. Mm -hmm. So I guess my comment is your pivoting needs to happen very early on. So I would take that first fundraise to go after the thesis that you're selling that you think that you have. If you're not seeing it very quickly, you need to pivot. We have an example in the portfolio of this, a company that does voice AI in terms of customer service, and they started in one industry, didn't work, literally tested three others, didn't work. And when they were probably four months from running out of cash, they tried one more industry, that did work. And then suddenly, very quickly, they came to us and like, look, we found the traction, but now we're gonna need money quickly in order to keep trying this out. And because we were the pre-seed, we invested again saying, yeah, we want you to keep trying this. We're seeing some proof points. Um, and then now there's many more proof points so they can get to a to an A. Um, but I do think a lot of that, I just, I don't know many companies that get to like a B without true product market fit, for instance. And even today's A's are pretty large. And so I do think that it, it pretty much all happens very early on. Tough technology like a Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which is not AI, but that takes just tons and tons of money. That stuff are very long-term problems that I think people agree just need mountains of cash to figure out. Um, but for all the, most of the stuff that's coming up today, I, I would say you sort of have only those first two rounds of cash to figure it out. Um, one more tangible thing I'll add really quick. Um, and her, what was, this is starting, to, the, the, the tide of this is starting to go out, I think, but being wary of enterprises' false indication of interest. Everybody got told to go, go find AI stuff for us to test, tire kick, everybody's gotta look smart, everybody's gotta have an AI strategy. You might have been part of that, you and 10 other companies that are now similar. So understanding, like having frank conversations, frankly, with your stakeholders, your champions, et cetera, like, is there actually budget behind this? Are, I wanna make you look good, of course, but you know, what to what end, right? Um, so being very careful to parse that out, of course, for yourself, but then in communicating that logo on your investor deck, like, is that real? Is that a POC? Is that going to convert? What's the success criteria for that to convert? Like, these are things that you need to be thinking about. Um, Definitely need to charge for pilots if you were thinking about making anything free yeah. Yeah. to get rid of that problem. Exactly. 
And also like, frankly, these buyers, they're using this as an opportunity to go educate themselves on your dime, especially if it's not a paid pilot. So um, presumably you are very smart and capable people because you're founding a company, right? And a lot of people, uh, I guess the most cynical words would be take advantage of that. Um, let me go figure out how to do my thing and then I'll make 80% of what you do in ChatGPT and call it a day. Hopefully you're not building a business that, where that can happen, but that's on people's mind. And can you comment um, also more on how to get that pilot opportunities? Yeah, um, so what I was saying at the beginning about the hospital, I think so marketing is huge for a lot of these. The earlier you can start and either get access to data or have a really great partner to build with who's supportive on your journey makes a very big difference for iterating sooner and faster. Um, there, I haven't really heard of that many like formal programs to help you find these pilots. I've been looking, certainly, I think you should leverage your ecosystem around you, right? So ask your VCs for enterprise intros if you're doing B2B and enterprise. Um, but I would say start with a subgroup of a few pilots, charge for that pilot, make sure you have some sort of contract language around that pilot so they can't copy what you're doing um, because many of them are just doing research, especially the bigger companies, and they're coming up with their own solutions. Um, you also want to be able to write in contractual language around keeping some of your competitors out. Um, so if you're going to be, let's say, doing a six-month pilot with them for maybe the six months after, unless if there's breach of contract, they can't use any other competitor. You can list them, but you can also be like, and it's just open to anyone else who's similar to this because you want to be able to protect your relationship with them, but also make sure that you're getting paid for this, that they take it seriously. Um, and as you're doing all these pilots, have a lot of check-ins. I mean, the companies that I'm seeing succeeding are talking to their customers nonstop. If they're not on a, you know, twice a week or once a week check-in, they're, they're checking in a lot, they're checking all the metrics, they're doing consistent reviews with those partners. So, you know, once every two weeks, they're showing all of the data, they're explaining what's breaking down. I think the other thing you should do is be very transparent about what isn't working. The last thing you want to do is just surprise them with what's failing. It's easier along the way to just kind of explain, hey, we ran into this issue. I'd love to figure out how to solve it with you. Uh, I think being transparent earlier on helps them trust you more, but also helps you solve your problems with them in a much more forgiving way than showing up months later, explaining everything kind of hit the bed. Um, and so... I think those are the biggest things. Um, around selling into pilot opportunities, look, you guys are probably all selling into different leadership positions within a given company. Um, but I would definitely push towards always doing things paid if you can, unless if somebody was a strategic investor or owns a stake in you anyways and is giving you access to something. It just means that they'll take it more seriously. Um, making yourself free is not always necessarily a good thing. I know it works in subscription as freemium models, but we're talking about things that cost you know five ten dollars to buy on our apple phone or android not things that cost you know tens of thousands of dollars um, and i would also set up a like streamlined approach for hey we do our first pilot it takes three months we then have a one month cycle where we talk to you about edits and do contract and then we move into full phase and kind of show them that you're not willing to just wait around forever for them to convert uh, i think that makes a big difference for your sales cycle um <clears throat> I think you covered so much ground, uh, Sasha. One one thing that uh, I would add to that is maybe having your success metrics baked into the pilot. So <clears throat> when you do deliver uh, targets and magic and, and sales or whatever, whatever the objective is, it should automatically translate into a paid contract on an ongoing basis. That would be the highest ideal form factor of a pilot us so you don't have to go through contractual stuff again oh one other thing i forgot when you first start you should ask them what their barometer of success is because yours might be quite different and so if you're judging yourself to a different standard let's say theirs is lower you could benefit from that but also just figure out what they really need it may be the case that you can give them the kitchen sink but if they only need two things start there because it's just going to make them the happiest sorry awesome. we have one more oh, i was just while the mic's moving up, I'll quickly say one more thing, which is also um, get help. Um, I love when founders put together like an early advisory board that might have industry executives that recently retired or you know at the point where they're able to spend a little bit of free time on you, uh, and definitely hold them accountable. And you can incentivize them, you know, through through equity. Uh, there are pretty common frameworks for that, but they can help be door kickers and um, sort of muscle to move through department heads or or get high level intros. Just 
um hi guys thank you for the insights this was awesome it was uh, very insightful uh, my name is bhuvesh mehta i recently moved to boston previously worked with a venture capital fund investing in food and ag my question is pretty simple for um, all of you um, which industry uh, are you looking at ai applications or automation which excites you and why and where are you looking at for deal flow sorry for for, for deal, deal flow is deal the second flow. half <clears throat> uh, which industry basically yeah, so um, for ai and it, which is exciting to you guys um ours from a i guess industry standpoint we're pretty agnostic we're focused on on enterprise use cases and um you know that can capture a lot of different things we also have a decent concentration in cybersecurity about a third of our portfolio touches touches um that as well as sort of compliance privacy and sort of adjacent areas um historically we haven't done as much sort of like deep bio stuff um some people who don't know us or and are from out of boston kind of look at us funny when we say that and we're in boston but plenty of other things to be investing in obviously um both uh sort of application layer both vertical and horizontal as well as sort of middle layer if you will tools and infra that <clears throat> play an important part in building a successful and defensible application so um being in boston about we we certainly get our share of healthcare and applied ai companies um outside of that like you know we're sector agnostic as well but um there's a healthy amount of enterprise um and then one of the other areas that we've been looking for good um, ideas and teams in um are, are places like uh, more tradition you know applying applying ai in more traditional industries so manufacturing uh the built world right those are areas that i think are underserved uh and there's some pretty significant businesses that can be built so uh we're always looking for you know awesome teams wor working in in those areas uh as well climate climate as well yes thank you energy climate he works with ctet <laughs> <laughs> um you're talking to three generalist funds on this panel so i feel a little bad but um we also do primarily b2b we are um we believe in big vertical deep moats so we look for companies that are trying to own within a specific industry we have a lot um historically and now in construction industrials um frankly unsexy businesses we've been in fintech we have agriculture i sit on the board of an ag tech company we just did a fundraise for them they use like satellite imagery and machine learning to look at crop health um and there i think there's a lot to be done in agriculture um and you can use the visual imagery to understand what's going on in the world especially around the fact that a lot of our climate predictions for temperature and other things are changing and all these models and so i think that's interesting um we have a big thesis around just voice and customer service as being the first frontier of where you'll see true not just adoption but ai working really well like you know if you call into we um are large shareholders of Cogito they're based here in Boston but that's voice AI so if you call Verizon if you call customer service do anything from appointment scheduling to a lot of the basic stuff we feel like that's one of the first areas it's just going to be easiest to do um it's just a less complex thing to understand across sectors if you're calling for a plumbing appointment that will also be done that way or basic customer service requests um and then on the healthcare side we're looking a lot at the brain which we think is really interesting um we are patient experience i think most things for healthcare that are more complex literally are going to take us 10 years on the ai side but most of these funds are 10 years so it's fine we have time um so uh that's generally kind of our thesis all of us for deal flow it comes from all over i think our main primary networks we're based here in boston right so a lot of the schools and the labs and everything that comes out of them our existing founders were on fund 4 so at this point we have a lot of founders in the portfolio who are for deals as well as the lp network um and then i guess lastly would just be other great funds like the ones i'm sitting right next to <laughs> we had another question um the gentleman with black t-shirt oh i was just piggybacking off your uh last point about pilots um okay so I uh, appreciated your point about pilots. Um I so my name's Jetty. I come from a bit of a generalist uh star founder background, lifelong entrepreneur, all those things. Uh last built a conversational AI inspired uh patient report outcomes product for addiction recovery in 2019. 
So um, qu quick question about how can you sort of get ahead of the issue of death by pilot? You're going from pilot to pilot to pilot. Uh, have you seen that before? Yeah, I have a portfolio. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You're no, gonna no, say please. something. Um, literally have a portfolio company dealing with that right now. You have to know when to exit. If a company is also not going to continue on with you or expand services, like I can't say which business, but we have a company that basically has to sell to every individual division in a company. And that's a huge pain. Like their business model is such that instead of selling at a macro level, you have to go in and sell this thing individually. So they're doing pilots with lots of different divisions. That is a very painful exercise. So actually we've gone in and been like, hey, we need to change your business model so that multiple people can access this within a company because this is never gonna move otherwise. Um, and so I think in terms of not getting stuck in the pilot wheel is a little bit of that setup in the beginning that Chad was talking about as well. Can you build in success metrics so that it can automatically trigger an event where that turns to full contract? Can you do something contractually that forces them to either pay you if something isn't going to transpire or that it just converts? I also think you have to be willing to like walk away if people are only, there must be a reason either in your product or the way that you're selling, if you are just not having matriculation to a full contract from all of these pilots. Um, because theoretically, if it's product market fit, it, they, they should wanna continue the product. Um, or it's the way that you've structured it in terms of a sales perspective that allows for you to continuously keep having pilots instead of turning it over to a contract. One of the failure modes, and it's <clears throat> it's hard to solve for, is if you're if you're in an industry or a space where the buying decision is is someone else, and the actual user of your technology or the pilot or the customer is somebody else. And there's typically, if there's a disconnect between those two and, you know, uh, then it's a problem. And typically, you're always trying to convince the value and, and you know, it's, it, it, so this is why if at the contract level, uh, you can create that alignment, create the success factors, and uh, in an ideal state, that would automatic should automatically translate. So, um, it, a lot of companies fall into this trap of uh, death by pilots. So it's very, very. You have to be. You have to um, sometimes, um, you know, be very creative and make sure that you're navigating this in a way where, um, you know, these are leading to something. In some cases. You know, even the data acquisition can be really valuable, right? So not necessarily. So there's a few different strategic reasons why companies tend to do pilots and and references, and you know, there's all sorts of reasons. But um, eventually, you know, the gold standard is it should convert into your top line revenues, basically. I think you, the more marketing you can do to them over the course of the process of how much you're succeeding, that that matters too. So back to the original, like ask them what the goal of this pilot is for them, what the success, met success metrics are, just continuously keep showing them. I think that that also psychologically keeps reinforcing, oh, this is a winning pilot. Like nobody gets fired for buying Oracle, IBM, Amazon, whatever, but they can get fired for buying you you're, if you're a new company. And so the idea of showing promising results and sort of being your own marketer throughout this whole process makes a big difference for them selling products internally as well to be able to get budget or continue with something or like sell this to other people in the company, which is usually the case. One more, a little bit more tactical piece, but on the product side too, if you have, you're selling to a team in one department, you know that team exists in a different department. Is there something you can build into the product that would allow really excited low level users of your product to go run around the office and at the water cooler and on Slack say like, whoa, I just tried this, it's awesome. And then you sort of get the groundswell coming in through different departments kind of laterally into your budget holder and buyer. I've seen a company um, do that very successfully where they started a pilot expressly with one team and before you knew it, three other teams around them wanted access to the product and guess what? They got a contract ahead of their pilot where their pilot was scheduled to be sold. That's Slack, that's the Slack example. The Slack play. Yeah. <laughs> Grading. That that goes back to your point earlier point about like workflows, knowing them inside out, backwards, forwards, and uh, frequently in healthcare startups, you're also going to see a separate workflow stream for uh, the whoever the clinical uh, person is uh, who that touches. So uh, that's thoughtful. Thank you. So uh, thank you all. One last comment on this uh, death by pilot. So um, 
the fact that you're not able to convert um, a pilot into a customer, there's a signal there, right? And so I think one needs to take a step back. If you're getting a lot of those signals where you're not converting, um, you know, you got to sort of take a moment and reflect on the product itself. Maybe you, you innovate on the business side of things. What is the service offering? Maybe you do pricing. You know, there's all sorts of things that, you know, if you're constantly doing the same thing and having the same results and people are not converting, you need to really look at your strategy. Okay. Sticking with pilots, clearly that's a, <clears throat> a issue for enterprise sales. So yeah. um, you mentioned doing the contracting up front, and one thing we've faced is after months of a sales cycle getting to a yes, then there's three or four months of procurement, especially if you want to be over a threshold for this pilot, for getting paid. Um, how do you think about that? Like, how do you think about um, expedience with getting the customer underway and getting feedback versus going through procurement and spending a few months there um, before getting the pilot underway? I think it comes down to cash flow planning, frankly. Um, a story comes to mind from a very large media company that shall remain nameless. Uh, there's a CTO of a division there. And in talking to him, he's like, my job is to help this company not kill startups because they are so big and the procurement process is so long. It's like two year sales cycle, especially in a frontier market like new offering, something exciting, right? There's a lot of hoops you got to jump through. So I think it comes back to actually in planning who you're going to go after, ideally you can get wind of, okay, what is a full end to end sales process look like, including a pilot. Is that feasible for me? Right. And then, you know, just thinking about, okay, maybe do I tackle smaller customer in the same segment, right? Get something marketable, get a quick win. Um, doesn't expressly answer your question about once you're in it, but, um, something to really consider before, especially for a B2B product before you launch in. Got a question back here. It seems like this side of the room has all the questions or all the microphones. Um, my name is Mike. Um, I exited my company earlier this year, 11X, uh, just EBITDA. So um, I'm looking at new investments. So explain to me, you almost hit on it, your last answer about how to monetize AI. What are the, what are the um, drivers to, in the end of the day, make money in, the, <laughs> in these firms? So what do you guys see in, uh, they could have the best model out there, but what is the drivers that you three see in creating value and monetize that actual um, technology? Go, go ahead. Yeah. All right, so I think um, monetization of broad AI, applied AI across, I mean, there's three or four core buckets that we've seen, right? So there's a lot of process optimization, which has been probably the first wave of products and services that we're seeing. So a lot of back office, a lot of call center services, where it's very easy, low regulatory hurdle rates, um, easy to build and easy to implement, especially if you're a running business and you, can, you have a captive uh, customer base. Um, the next phase of opportunities were really when existing processes or existing products had bolt-on AI capabilities, right? Opened up perhaps new revenue streams for existing companies. And, um, but a lot of these tend to be, um, when you bolt on AI to existing products, they, they tend to be for incumbents in the industries and they tend to create incremental value. Um, a lot of our focus, and I can just comment from, from our standpoint, is like we, we're, all, we're looking for things that can potentially transform uh, how value is created and captured in a certain sector, leveraging AI. That is really interesting. And I think a lot of that exponential value capture uh, happens when you uh, use first principles thinking and you solve a problem using completely new uh, uh, sort of ways to address and create these user experiences 
that create the stickiness, that create the, that allow you to have fundamentally different economics, you know, uh, so all of that translates and aligns to something that unlocks a lot of value. So as a, as a studio, as a fund, we look for teams that are really building what we call as like AI first businesses, right? Which are fundamentally capturing new value and looking to transform sectors from the first principles up. This has been a really great session so far. So much wisdom coming out of this. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left, so we can probably sneak in a, can question, I ask a question or question? two. Yes, please. <laughs> so um, thank you. Thank you for contributing to this. So um, while you were um, talking about, um, so let's put it this way. What's the role of incubators to support the startups, AI-based startups? If you want to comment on that. Okay, I'll uh, take that one since uh, uh, we run an incubator. So uh, the, uh, we call them studios. Uh, we call ourselves studio. And the reason is, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to build something from a first principles point of view and really look at sort of an AI first strategy and say, okay, uh, we have no legacy investments. We have, you know, just, we see the opportunity um, there's a large addressable market size, there's a real pain point or a need. Uh, how, do we, how do we solve for it? And so we think the studio is really sort of the best uh, strategy to build, um, uh, build companies from the first principles up. And the reason is because our approach is bringing all the right stakeholders in a room um, and really breaking down these opportunities across marketing, across business models, across technologies, and then mapping what's the best way to, um, you know, to create something really magical. And so, um, you know, this multi sort of stakeholder approach where we have sector experts, we have technical experts, and we have capital, uh, I think is a, is a really fantastic way to, uh, especially if you're trying to reimagine, uh, you know, a sector or a space. Uh, so that's kind of why we think it's a great, great place. And, and we also remove a lot of the, early stage inefficiencies. So one of the things as a serial entrepreneur, the reason why we started the company uh, or uh, the thinking was that, you know, the zero to one and the zero to sort of four year period, entrepreneurs face a lot of very similar kind of challenges. There's a, there's a very high degree of inefficiency uh, for most people, right? Uh, there are always exceptions, right? But for most entrepreneurs, there's a lot of inefficiency in getting the right uh, getting to the right capital, to the right subject matter experts, to customer feedback, uh, but how can we accelerate that? So if you get the right sort of expertise in the room, can we accelerate your part, uh, your path to market or uh, a path to an outcome? So whether Techstars or Mass Challenge or Y Combinator or any of the many, many incubators, accelerators, and different programs that are out there, I think this is also a function of how much help do you need early on and do you think you can do it without the ecosystem help? So if you're a serial entrepreneur, you probably don't need it. If you have a network of VCs, if you understand product market fit, if you've done sales, go to market, you probably need less of this. Whereas if you're a newer entrepreneur, you don't know what you don't know. And the truth is a lot of what these companies are helping you do is just avoid some of the pitfalls. They'll connect you with lawyers. They'll help introduce you to potential funders. So we recruit for, or we get companies from a lot of them. Um, and they'll just help fill out your ecosystem. And to me, that val how much is that value worth to you? It should be large if you've never done this before and don't have access. Uh, it's the equivalent to me of going to like an Ivy League and just things being handed to you on a silver platter in a way. We can hear you. Um, you. You talked a little bit about SaaS and being parents of the state SaaS business. Maybe I have personal questions about that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about the KPIs for SaaS companies are pretty well established. Are there KPIs that you see emerging for AI companies that might be early signal that you should be thinking about a pivot or, you know, you're getting that traction? Um, you know, curious if there's anything you'd recommend. I think um, just really quickly, and definitely want to hear from these two, the uh, thinking about your product performance, right? In that workflow that we talked about earlier, uh, how accurate are your models? Again, very dependent on your models and what you're addressing, but like how accurate is it? Um, great if you can get to human level accuracy, 
you'll find that some will hold you to a higher bar because they're used to the SaaS, right? I want to know that you're going to do this better than anybody I could hire. I don't want to have to buy your product and then still pay for someone to check it, who I'm also still going to have to pay their full salary because I need to trust them that they're going to catch the mistakes or find the diagnosis or find whatever outcome your product has. So um, it goes back to clear communication with the stakeholder that you're selling to, building for. Hey, here's where I think we're at out of the box. And then also to the point on pivot, understanding, okay, if I have access to all of the data I could possibly get my hands on and I'm, performance is not going up, I mean, that's a black and white example, but as is there's, I think, a, a, a diminishing returns, right? And diminishing effort of if it's gonna be so much more time and effort and toil and capital to get the incremental data just to get relevant, th that's something to think about. Awesome, we only have five more minutes, so I, I ask my last question and then we open it up for two more questions. So um, let's talk about the model wars. Can you comment on that and what to choose, what that could impact the business? I mean, our thesis as a fund, um, this is one school of thought, is that eventually it'll basically become a public utility. Um, that at the end of the day, the thing that matters most is the underlying data itself, and that you're seeing so many of these pop up. I think right now you're still having all the model wars. It probably does make a difference right now what you choose, what shuts down, if anything happens. But in the long term, we sort of see this as a little bit of a race to the bottom in a way. Um, and so we do think it will become fully commoditized at some point. It's one school of thought. I'm not saying it's necessarily right or wrong. I'm just saying it's how we approach it as a thesis. And it does drive some of the questions that we ask companies when they come in to pitch. Yeah, I think it's a basic infrastructure as we're building out <clears throat> applied AI and AI platforms uh, on top. And one of the things that we're, so, a lot of our teams are now using multiple uh, LLMs and aggregating and, and figuring out ways on how to leverage the strengths of each of these platforms. And, and so that's one thing. The other thing is the cost of compute, the cost of compute and tracking that as you scale your business is another um, important metric, I think, um, to keep an eye on. So um, one important distinction, that's LLMs. Right? Remember, there's all kinds of other models that you could build, um, other AI to leverage, and um, depending on the domain, some may have data that you know large language models never saw. Right, So are you able to fine tune them? Do you explore building your own small models that are more domain specific? I think the jury's definitely still out on um, you know, what is like the best approach. I think it's very highly case dependent, but from an LLM standpoint, definitely agree with these two that it's trending towards commoditization. And just like you're, you know, starting up and it's like, all right, do I do AWS, GCP, or Azure? You know, I think it'll be that dynamic for LLM providers going forward. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Thank you for dumping out your brains in front of us. Um, very rich, it's awesome, you should have a podcast. Um, so as a marketing veteran, I'm specifically uh, grateful for the conversation we had earlier about um, using consumers, consumer insight, consumer slash customer, using it interchangeably here, um, about optimizing your, your value proposition and sharpening um, you know, your message and market product fit in the end. My question is specifically, what is your thought about um, strategies, particularly maybe AI strategies, to engage non-users or churn customers, or specifically people who do not use your, use your products, avoiders? What do you think about, you know, actively using those information to sharpening your proposition, talking about scaling and pivoting tactics. Just love to hear a little bit more about that. And if you can keep your answer to 20 seconds, that would be great. <laughs> sure. Um, 
I think the first question is why is somebody churning? So if somebody's there, your biggest point of feedback is people who stop using your product. And so you should be making the workflow difficult to cancel. Uh, I love it. Adobe is a great example. If you try to cancel InDesign or Illustrator, it's actually difficult. They want to charge you a penalty fee. Then they want to offer you a discount. Then they still want to know if you're going through the process. Like unsubscription is so difficult and they did a great job. So like if you can find out why people are churning and really use that data and force them to give you that answer, especially if it's like a cheaper product so you're not having whole enterprise conversation. I think that makes a really big difference. The one other comment that I would make is more of a um, marketing outward instead, which is make sure you show case studies, whether to B2B or to consumers. Like we have a sales video product and the way that they use their product, they use deep fakes, but not everybody knows it's a deep fake and that weirds out some people and other people are totally normal with it. And so showing case studies to help people understand why folks are actually okay with a deep fake was super helpful. So that's less about avoiding the churn or using those users, but just on the front end, how to create enough transparency if you have a unique product to make sure people understand it and aren't surprised by like outcomes. Awesome. Thank you, panel. Oh, yes, and uh, we hope today's insight provide you with the strategy for your s startup success. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, panel. Wonderful. And if you're going to stick around for a couple of minutes, we've got 15 minutes between sessions. If you didn't know, we've got some special guests this evening. Elaine Chow is going to be here, the head of economic development for Massachusetts, and Scott Kirsner from the Boston Globe. That's going to be a great session this evening. Next is... Another good one, innovation at scale, keeping the startup spirit alive. And so we're going to have another all-star panel. So stretch out, walk around, make some